Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's kind of difficult sometimes when the Holy Gospel that's supposed to be full of hope and truth ends on the note where the devil is going to show back up. <laughs> right? And then we all say the Gospel of our Lord. Oh, praise to you, O oh Christ. And it is good news. We'll get there. I must confess to you today that I'm very happy that I'm a Wolfpack fan. My condolences to all of you Duke fans. My congratulations to all of you Carolina fans. I just had to get that out of the way because in no way is this a reference to a blue devil but an evil spirit. Okay? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jean and I were incredibly blessed to be able to travel to the Holy Land in 2018. We got to do some really great things on that trip. We renewed our vows, our wedding vows, at the spot in Cana where Jesus performed his first miracle. I got to preach on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Man, that'll tear you up. We got to have some private time in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. We got to affirm our baptisms at the River Jordan. Did we go in? I did. Up to my knees because I could. But none of the affirmations took place in the actual Jordan. The Jordan water we used for the affirmation was in a font on the bank of the river. It was still Jordan River water, but that whole event didn't quite take place the way I had envisioned it. I envisioned us going down into it. And when you get there, you see why you don't. Because the Jordan River is really unclean water, especially now. It was in Jesus' day, but it's even more so now because there are seven dams in the olive orchards barely feeding into the River Jordan where they take people. So in retrospect, knowing now what we saw there, rather than the mental images that we'd had in our head all our lives, you know, the still water of the River Jordan, and it's just beautiful and clean and clear in Jesus, and no, nah, it's turbulent. It's murky. It's muddy. It makes sense to those of us who pay attention to biblical numbers also that Jesus would be sent into the wilderness by the Spirit for 40 days right after that. Now, at Jesus' baptism, the purest human ever sank himself into the murky, dirty waters of the Jordan in there with the rest of us sinners. And what an incredible reframing of that picture. Jesus, the Holy One, clean, lowering himself into our uncleanliness for his own baptism before being sent into the wilderness where our voices cry out to him. Now, many folks miss that Jesus was sent into that spot, that wilderness place that nobody likes to go for 40 days. 40 days is consistently the go-to number for a, t a period of t trial time, of questioning, some sort of probationary period of some sort. Think about it. Throughout biblical history, Moses had 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, Noah and the ark, David and Goliath, Elijah and Mount Horeb, Jonah and the city of Nineveh. 146 times in Scripture, that number 40 shows up as a challenge period. Maybe not even on our time frame of 40 days, but as a time of trial. Save us from the time of trial. Now that's okay for mere mortals, but here's Jesus himself being sent into a challenge period. His own wilderness experience. Here is the fully human aspect of the also fully divine Savior. Note that he was sent into that wilderness with a specific thing, to be tempted. He was not sent to succumb or give in to the temptation. He was sent there to be tempted. Now, I don't know who among us fasts, and that's probably a good thing because Scripture tells us we shouldn't boast about those personal pieties at all or make them appear as a hardship to our faith but a practice unto God and God alone. 
Scripture does tell us that Jesus fasted in the wilderness. So when Scripture tells us Jesus was hungry, he most definitely was. And the devil is really good at trying to capitalize on our weaknesses, right? The first place the devil went to with Jesus was the obvious. Jesus being hungry. What is it that we hunger for? And how easy is it for the devil to turn our heads to something that we desperately want, even if it's the wrong thing for us to consume? The daredevil showed up with all of his ifs. If you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. You're God, right? You can do this. You can satisfy yourself. Come on, you know you're hungry. Let's go, miracle man. Do your stuff. Eat. If. If you are the Son of God. Jesus bypassed that dare. And he did it by referencing Scripture. As it is written every time. As it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Not today, daredevil. You've seen the t-shirts. Not today, Satan. Nice try. There's a reason that Jesus fasted. And when you dangle carrots in front of him to make him do tricks for you, you lose. Strike one. Daredevil then showed Jesus every kingdom in the world in a flash. See, the devil has an awful lot of power and he knows it. He can do that stuff. He can show us potential control and what can be ours, our own little kingdoms, even when everything belongs to God. Daredevil told Jesus he was in control of all those kingdoms. Big fat lie, but that's what he told him. He's gotten under their skin in sin, and the humans will always, since the Garden of Eden, pay the devil quite a bit of attention. But if, Jesus, if, you will deny your authority over all of these kingdoms if you will worship me too, if you will concede your power to me, I will give these kingdoms to you. Go right ahead. Hey, Jesus, put me first. Let me control your thoughts and get under your skin and introduce you to sin. It'll only hurt for a second, I promise. Where do we feel out of control? What area of our lives do we feel that in? And what would we be willing to do to get that control back? Are we willing to sell our souls to the devil, claiming things for ourselves instead of giving God glory and asking for his help, as it is written? This daredevil said, If, if you will worship me, I'll give you power. Jesus bypassed that there too. How? By referencing scripture. As it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And if you're a catechism student, there's your sign. Commandment one. We do it with fingers. That's okay. And it's also a little bit of commandment two. You want to know what that means? See me later. Not today, daredevil. Nice try. I know who created those kingdoms in the first place. I know where your real power comes from, and it's not you, devil. I'm not giving in to your misconception of how less powerful God is. You lose again, devil, strike two. Daredevil then took Jesus to the tallest place in all of Jerusalem. The devil was playing hardball. He does that. Jerusalem? Seriously, Jerusalem? The holy city? The most desired city in the entire world where Jesus would arrive as king in triumph. This is the very area where Jesus would be betrayed and die and rise as king forevermore. Ultimate power. Jesus, really? If... You are that powerful. Throw yourself down from here. Nothing will harm you if you're all that. Here, Jesus, since you're all about quoting scripture, here's some scripture for you. And the daredevil says, see, I know the holy book. 
I know it too. If you, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down and see what happens. Your own holy book says something about that. The daredevil quotes scripture. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you on their hands. They will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. See, Jesus, I know scripture. And I have no problem using your own holy book against you if necessary to get under your skin for sin. No problem. I know the book. And I will twist it and turn it in your ears to make you think things that go against God's will are okay for you. Go ahead. Throw yourself off the building. Your own holy book says you'll be fine. Just do it. Jesus bypass the dare. How? By referencing scripture. This is why this is important. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Not today, devil. Not ever, devil. Nice try. Glad you know the book, but you're using it wrong. You are using it in the worst form of the word use. You're using it to get what you want. And that's not God's will. That's your will. Trying to fit God's word into it for justification of your own actions. No, I will not abide by your twisted version of scripture. I will not allow you to twist it on me. You lose for the third time, daredevil. Now it would be great if the devil paid as much attention to biblical numbers as we do. He could not care less how many strikes he gets. He's going to keep going. He's going to keep pushing. He wants to be under our skin and sin, and he's nothing he loves more than a good challenge of a person that claims to be a Christian. That's his favorite place. When the devil finally left Jesus alone in the wilderness, he didn't really stop. Strike out is not part of the daredevil's vocabulary. The devil just left Jesus until an opportune time, right? We know when that time was, don't we? But do we see those opportune times when they come for us? Remember, we talked several weeks ago about entry points and sealing those up. Those opportune times do come for us and sometimes in multiples and way beyond three strikes. Watch what the devil tries to do to you. The devil was not above using his own version of a first commandment voice with Jesus Christ. And he's not above using it with us. He got Adam for a piece of fruit for Pete's sake. Adam went to lunch with the devil. But Jesus stood him up. The devil called it a rain check. I'll be back for you. But Jesus took the high road, literally. It is certain that the devil's ifs, if you are this, will dare us to follow him instead of Christ. It is certain that the prizes that the devil dangles in front of us will be tempting very tempting, and he will do his best to get under our skin in sin. It is certain that the devil's tests will be impossible to pass without the power of the Holy Spirit by our side. How is it that we can read and study and pray about our Savior and his own encounter with the daredevil and think that that same daredevil will ever leave us alone? He won't. He's ruthless and reckless and determined to never give up on us. Good news, we have a Savior who doesn't give up on us either. Here's the daredevil for you. If you follow Christ, feed yourself with whatever satisfies you. Scratch that itch. Go ahead, it won't really matter. If you follow Christ, take this power that I'm offering you. You won't see the whole power of Christ until you die but I can give you some power right here, right now. Don't you want that? 
Why wait for it when you truly deserve this? Come and get your best life on right now. If you follow Christ, he will save whatever we can dirty up for you. We can party hard and never even think about God's laws because Jesus has got you and doesn't even care about you paying any attention to those things. He came to fix all that mean, old, scary God in the Old Testament as if they were supposed to be read apart. You've got soft Jesus, that one that will love everything you ever do, whether it's right or wrong. We can convince you that you have no purpose, no meaning, that this life is too much for you. This daredevil can even convince some people that their life means nothing. Go ahead. Throw yourself down. Just see what Christ will do for you. Don't you know your own holy book? I do. Mess yourself up on purpose. It'll be fine. That book really doesn't matter. You can twist it all you want. Go ahead. I'll still be here for you if he doesn't kick it in gear for you. People of God, if God's word is being used to test God right there is the devil. Now, Dr. Reznor, my homiletics professor at Hood, is shouting in my ear, give them some good news already, would you? So here we go. Good news. When we enter the wilderness, whatever that wilderness looks like, and it's different for most of us, and some of it is the same, whatever your wilderness looks like, devastation of a relationship, something in your history you wish you could let go of, a vocation problem, a challenging health concern, too many bad days in a row, whatever that wilderness looks like for you. When the storms of life threaten to blow us away, faith in Jesus and his power answers it with, it is written. It's already done. It is written. And it is lived out with our eternal Lord. Jesus is on your side. Jesus is by your side. No twisting of scripture. No strikes for us. We are his. We are God's children and we are saved by Jesus Christ. Here's a good old Martin Luther quote for you. What kind of temptation would it be if it were not forsaken and stood not alone? For there I am in the true school and I learn what I am and how weak my faith is how great and rare true faith is, and how deeply unbelief is entrenched in the hearts of all men. Temptation is not succumbing to temptation. Those are two different things. The dares of the devil are only that. They're only dares. The devil cannot do more than he can do. The devil cannot fill your soul with peace. The devil cannot give you comfort that lasts. The devil has no control of us into eternity and cannot offer us anything better than God Almighty already has. And the biggest thing we need to remember on this earth is the lesson that Jesus taught the devil in the wilderness. The devil cannot control us without our permission When we trust in God, he will not give the devil that permission. When we struggle with our obedience, there's Jesus in the wilderness with a daredevil telling him off simply and thoroughly and remaining bound to God and the promises that we receive through word and sacrament. The worldly wilderness is for the devil. The journey through The worldly wilderness ends with our new beginning in Christ Jesus, our risen and eternal Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.